Hello, it's Mr. Ripka, reading Neruda during Corona. And today you have clicked on the season finale, the last one. Yes, poem LXXIV, poem 74 of Ripka reads Neruda. Folks, we have been doing this for at least 74 days. I missed a few days in there, so probably at least 80 days. So almost three months we have been on the COVID-19 quarantine, and Ripka has been reading Neruda during Corona, and today is the last day, and it's a really beautiful day. It's, summer has come. It is June 18th. St. Peter and Paul High School is, is going to have their commencement the ending and the beginning, just like what we're doing, an ending and yet a beginning, the beginning of summer. There's so many things uh, to say. It's just, this is the, the last poem of something that we started so long ago. Uh, this is no haircut for the whole quarantine, a little trimming of the beard, but not really much. Uh, in a way, I've got to see myself and you've got to see what happens after three months of uh, not cutting the hair and not trimming the beard too much. And so it was a nice experiment for me. I haven't done that in a while, so um, we'll see what happens throughout the summer. But at any rate, I want to get to the poetry. Let's do that. Because we're here to listen, really, to what Pablo Neruda has to tell us. And even though this is the last episode, we don't want to become maudlin. No. So we're going to read poem LXXIV in uh, Espanol. Then I'm going, to, I'm going to discuss it a little bit and read it in English. And then what I'd like to do is reread the two previous poems. So that would be poem 72, 73, and 74. Because all three of those poems seem to uh, come together to create a group of questions that have to do with seasons. And if you remember correctly, the the poems before that, there were two poems before that, was poem 70 and 71. Uh, that was that very difficult uh, episode of, of reading these. these. Those had to do with Hitler and the punishments that Hitler uh, has in hell, at least the Nerudian punishments. If you haven't seen that one, I uh, feel free to click on that one. It'll be at the end of the video because that one, it seemed, those two seem to make a group. And it's a dark group of questions. And then the last three seem to make a group of questions about the seasons. Um, so he ends, once again, as we said yesterday, our last episode, that he ends on the season imagery. It makes me start to think, are there other groupings? And does the whole work, all 74 poems, could you somehow group some of the poems together and see a movement Perhaps the Hitler was dark and it was about death and the seasons are about change and, and uh, birth and life and the cycle of things. Anyway, I want you to have your own thoughts about that. So let's get to it, hey? All right, in uh, Espanol, poem 74, the last one, it says, Por que se queda en los ramajes hasta que las horas se caen? Y donde se quedan colgados sus pantalones amarillos? Verdad que parece esperar el otoño que pase algo. Tal vez el temblor de una hoja o el tránsito del universo. Hay un imán bajo la tierra, imán hermano del otoño. Cuando se dicta bajo tierra la designación de la rosa. That's the last word of this work. Rosa, La Rosa, De La Rosa. And then the last line was La des, uh, Designación de la Rosa. La Designación de la Rosa. And so the designation of the rose or perhaps the appointment, the appointment of the rose. A beautiful flower. He mentions the rose before. A lot of these images he has brought up before. He has brought up before, of course, leaves. Why did all the beautiful leaves, I think he once said, go to uh, Paris or France? He's uh, brought up the color yellow. This was the last, this is the last poem of our book. And at the very first poem, some three months ago, perhaps, we read which yellow bird 
fills its nests with lemons. Yes, that was Qual el, es el pájaro amarillo. Pájaro amarillo. Here we have pantalones amarillos. Yellow pants. Yellow pantaloons. Yes. He also has uh, otoño. That is your autumn, of course. And then he has hoja, which could be a leaf. He's done that a lot before, hasn't he? We had las hojas up there, and now we have hoja, leaf. Uh, we have universo. He get the universe. He, he loves talking about the sky and uh, the moon and, and the sun and the universe. And then he has, of course, as I said before, tierra, and then the designación de la rosa. Ending on the beautiful image of the rose. What does it mean? I want that. That is uh, for you to think about, of course. All right, let us uh, read through these in English, have some reflections, and then I will read through the last three together, all in English, which will be a total of six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen questions that are just going to go boom, 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 seventeen times. Uh, and by the end of it, I think we're going to feel this sort of this philosophical uh, days of of uncertainty, which is a good place to be. Socrates thinks so. It seems like Neruda thinks so. Rilke thinks so. I would even go as far as saying Keats, the great poet, the young poet, uh, thinks so. Uh, Shakespeare thinks so. It seems like a good place to be. That is a place of um, numbness in the mind so that you can now begin to learn. And perhaps that's what these questions are doing, helping us get rid of our habitual way of thinking, numbing us a little bit, making us numb, not in a way that we're not tuned to the earth, but numbing us for like days, like what? I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. And then from there, because of the interesting images, we then begin to make our own sense out of things and not just inherit the senses that we have read or learned from the past. Though we must, let's not forget Remember the past, but let's not let it control us. Let's get to this. Mr. Rifka, get off your soapbox. Here we go. I must be getting sentimental, I think, in this last episode. All right. Poem 74 in English. It says, why does it linger in the branches until the leaves fall? You might be asking yourself, what? What is that pronoun, it? What, what does that refer to? Why would he do that in the first poem? This is why I'm going to read all three of them eventually, because the last question of the previous poem says, uh, does autumn, el otoño, does autumn enter legally? Does it enter, I guess, the earth or it, uh, its presence legally? Or is it an underground season? Woo, a clandestine season. Is it sneaking up? And people are like, whoa, where'd you come from, autumn? We were enjoying summer. Hard to tell. So that's what the it refers back to, this, this autumn, which is entering legally or perhaps uh, clandestinely. So why does it, el otoño, autumn, why does it linger in the branches until the leaves fall? Woo! I guess that makes sense. Autumn lingers until the leaves fall, then by the time the leaves have fallen, I'm guessing that it, autumn's gone and winter has arrived. Let's see what else he has to say. And where are its yellow trousers left hanging? Y donde se quedan colgados? And where are they left hanging? Sus pantalones amarillos, its yellow pantalones, its yellow pants. I'm guessing that its is still autumn. Uh, we've personified it. It's wearing yellow trousers, yellow pantalones. And he's wondering, and where are Autumn's yellow trousers left hanging? Oh, because it's left, right? Why does it linger in the branches until the leaves fall? And then where did its yellow trousers go? Oh, Autumn. Hey, man, legally, clandestinely, not sure. Why are you lingering around? And where did you put your yellow pants, Autumn? All right, the next one says, Is it true that Autumn seems to wait for something to happen? He came around and lingered. Hmm. Guess I'll hang here for a while. It was all autumn. And then he just waited around for something to happen. I guess that happened is winter. That's what happened. Yes, verdad que is it true 
He does like asking questions with that, right? Verdad que parece esperar. Mm -hmm. Just for something, is it, you know, just wait for something to happen. El otoño que pase algo. All right, he comes back to the leaf. Remember the first question of this poem was, why does it linger, autumn linger in the branches until the leaves fall? The fourth question says, perhaps the trembling of a leaf or the movement of the universe. That must be referring back to the previous question. Is it true that autumn seems to wait for something to happen? Perhaps the trembling of a leaf or the movement of the universe. Wow, powerful images. The trembling of a leaf seems fragile, small, delicate. The trembling of the universe seems massive, colossal, huge, humongous. The movement of the universe. Yes, transito del universo. Is Autumn waiting for something to happen, for just a tremble? And then he's like, ooh, I gotta go. Came in clandestinely, better leave, also like that. Or is he waiting for the, boom, the movement of the universe? He's like, my time, gotta get out of here. Whew. Number five, is there a magnet under the earth? Brother magnet of Autumn? What a weird question. I mean, cool. Is there a magnet under the earth? You know, we do talk about a compass, you know, moving its uh, needle north and south, having to do with a magnet. But then he goes, a brother magnet of autumn. Iman hermano. Yeah, Iman, a magnet, hermano, brother del otoño. What could that mean, a brother magnet of autumn? Like autumn's brother magnet. Oh, maybe there's a magnet under the earth attracting it. Dude, it's time to come back. It's a brother magnet. Autumn is a magnet. Maybe, I don't know, it has a brother magnet under the earth telling Autumn to come back after he left clandestinely. He's like, where'd he go? I don't know. He just absconded. And now he's like, you better call him back. Get the magnet out. Last question. And then he says, when is the appointment of the rose decreed under the earth? I wonder if he's talking about springtime again. He leaves on an image of spring. When is it decreed under the earth that called autumn for winter to be here? When is it decreed under here for the rose to come up? The beautiful rose. Perhaps an image of hope, or at least as we know from traditionally an image of love, which is uh, something that unites us. It really, And Pablo is known also as a love, Pablo Neruda is known as a love poet, even though this book, El Libro de las Preguntas, the book of questions, is are full of, this is full of childlike questions um, that he wrote toward the end of his life. As we talked about before, they pierce through uh, the mundane living of life, and they combine through love and through images. They combine, like love, I should say, they combine through images, the uh, sort of waking and the sleeping world, the abstract and the concrete world, uh, all these wonderful worlds. I just want to say, before we go through and read all all uh, the last three poems, because I think it's going to be really entertaining just to hear, boom, boom, 17 season questions before we end this this episode and this, this season of Rivka Reads. Uh, this is, of course, season one, Rivka Reads Neruda, during Corona, special season. Before we, before we leave this, I want to remind us about... Um, one of the joys for me of reading Neruda, and that is that he asks questions that, that are not really meant to be answered. And they remind us that there are important, profound questions out there that the answer will arise. But as Rilke, the great German poet, once says, these questions, you have to live them. You don't, there's no necessity. There's no necessary reaching out for truths and, and just finding the first one and grabbing it and saying, that's mine and that's my foundation. But instead, live the questions, is what Rilke says. And I think these, you know, Pablo Neruda, if anything, has taught me to, to do that a little more. That is, live the questions. Don't, don't try to answer everything with a finale, with an ending question. But it also reminds me of... Uh, what's called neg negative capability. I might have read this before, but it's uh, negative capability is uh, first is a phrase. It was used first by the romantic poet John Keats, the young John Keats in 1817. Uh, and it, it's used to characterize, as it says here, 
um, I'm reading it from my phone, to characterize the capacity of the greatest writers to pursue a vision of artistic beauty, even when it leads them into intellectual confusion and uncertainty, as opposed to a preference for philosophical certainty over artistic beauty. So it's a negative capability. It is a capacity, an ability for the greatest art, the greatest writers and artists, okay, to just take where, to go wherever their art leads them, even if it leads them into intellectual confusion or uncertainty. The greatest writers have been able, and artists have been able to do that, he claims, and not grasp for, for philosophical certainty some sort of certain foundation. That's Keats, lovely poet, died young, but known not only, of course, for this, this interesting philosophical idea, negative capability, uh, but also, of course, for the great, great poet poems, uh, the ode on a Grecian urn, ode to the nightingale, lovely, beautiful poems. Uh, La belle dame, sans merci, uh, these are beautiful, beautiful poems. Um, so at any rate, Pablo Neruda, I just wanted to say, he, he seems to help me do that, and I hope he's helped you a little bit. That is, he's helped ask questions, and then at first we might be tempted to answer them. And, and that could be fun, and we could answer them in a fun way, but is that the meaning here? Is that what he really wants us to do? And so uh, I think Neruda's questions are so simple and so interesting that they remind me in a concrete way of Rilke's live the questions of life and of Keats's negative capability of go where your art takes you, even if it leads to confusion. That's better than just superficially grabbing some philosophical foundation. And of course, confusion like Socrates is where truth begins. To get confused is to, to start over with your thinking and making sure this time that you have a solid foundation as you build up. I hope these questions have broken down perhaps some of the sediment in our minds, it has in mine, and helped us in our own way start building up our own questions and our own existence and our own definitions and our own beauty and our own truth. I don't want to keep going, so let's just stop there. So I'm going to go through poem, once again, like I said at the beginning, 72, 73, 74, all in order in English and just hit you with these questions so that you can start feeling the uncertainty and then I will say goodbye and say thank you of course but let's do this here we are poem 72 if all rivers are sweet where does the sea get its salt how do the seasons know they must change their shirt why so slowly in winter and later with such a rapid shudder? And how do the roots know they must climb toward the light and then greet the air with so many flowers and colors? Is it always the same spring who revives her role? We're on to 73 now. Who works harder on earth, a human or the grain sun? Between the fir tree and the poppy, whom does the earth love more? Between the orchids and the wheat, which does it favor? Why a flower with such opulence and wheat with its dirty gold? Does autumn enter legally or is it an underground season? We're on to poem 74. Why does it linger in the branches until the leaves fall? And where are its yellow trousers left hanging? Is it true that autumn seems to wait for something to happen? Perhaps the trembling of a leaf or the movement of the universe? Is there a magnet under the earth, brother magnet of autumn? When is the appointment of the rose decreed under the earth? And there you are, folks. We have completed Pablo Neruda's book, El Libro de las Preguntas, the book of questions. Yes, if you stayed with us, it says here there are 320 questions in this book composed of the 74 poems. So you have listened to 320 questions total in the last 70 plus videos and days. So I just want to leave by saying thank you. I want to thank Pablo Neruda first. Thank you, Pablo. 
Thank you for all that you've done. Those questions were beautiful, and they're going to help me enjoy my summer even more. So thanks, Pablo. Yep, he deserves it. And I want to um, thank you guys if you're out there watching. Just thanks for watching. This is a long video, I know, but I want to say thank you. That's been a long time, 70-plus videos. So thank you for sticking around or popping in once in a while. I appreciate it. I hope, I guess, that these videos brought you as much joy and reflection or at least some of the joy and reflection uh, as, as I felt and as, uh, as I was reading these during the COVID-19 quarantine. And really, I just wish, I want to end by wishing you a glorious summer and a glorious uh, 2020, the rest of 2020, and even 2021, just a glorious life. But I do want to wish you a glorious, splendid, bright, exquisite summer. And I hope that during your summer, you don't forget a little bit about Pablo Neruda and about the childlike questions and about Rilke who wants us, of course, not just to read these questions, but to live these questions. Thank you.